afternoon everybody and uh, thanks for taking the time to join us just a brief view on today's project we met last october or whenever it was and we discussed brexit at that point in time and a few things have changed since then as you're probably aware uh, despite the fact that COVID has suppressed most of the news other than COVID news, um, revenue has been making some changes to the plan system. So what we want to go through with you today is what they call the PBN, the pre booking notification. It may be new to most of you. And the object really today is to get as many questions as possible either this afternoon or over the coming days because we have a meeting with revenue now uh, next week or the week after and we want to try and build up the bank of queries. There's only so many queries we can come up with ourselves. So as to get everybody thinking about this and what the implications are and what queries that, that you would you would like to answer. So we're gonna share with you the revenue presentation. So it's very much the Irish side of the movements in and out of the UK. It's obviously gonna be quite light on the HMRC side, but we will touch on that briefly as well and also we can discuss very briefly land bridge but one of the projects that we have at the moment is we want to try and map out all the different routings so we we can look at dublin hollyhead dublin liverpool liverpool dublin uh dover calais dover zebrug uh, hooker holland to, to hull or wherever and try and map all those journeys out so that you would know what the implications are for each journey because unfortunately there is not one common solution for every routing. And where we have ports that have inventory systems in place, some of, some of uh, the implications of the PBN or the GPMS will be softened. So we just need to be aware of that. So over time, we hope to be able to map out all of the different routings. Um, but really today, we'd like to discuss the PBN uh, and get your ideas and queries about how the PBN is going to operate just to give you a rough idea of, of where it's come from, if you remember last October, we were saying that you must make your export declaration in the UK for an export load coming to Ireland, and your import declaration needs to be both on, on the systems, the respective systems chief or AEP system, and the safety and security declaration. And you would need to go to the ferry operator and quote those three MRNs. Or indeed, if you have multiple shipments, you might have to quote six MRNs, 10 MRNs, 20 MRNs. So everybody felt that that was rather cumbersome. And initially in, in France, because they were working on a similar concept going on, on uh, the tunnel, uh, the French came up with this idea of the logistics envelope. So we can group all the MRNs for one trailer into a logistics envelope. And the French called this system uh, SE Brexit. And then the the UK adopted a similar concept and they're calling it the GVMS and the Irish adopted the concept as well and called it the PVN. So the, the basic concept is going to be that customs will develop a web portal on the revenue website. And this web portal will give access to anybody. It's not behind Ross. You don't have to have a cert to access this. So it's not that you, you need to be registered in some way with revenue. There will be free access into this web portal. And the portal will carry out three functions. It was going to give us our pre-booking notification, the PBN. It will give a channel lookup facility that we'll discuss later. And it will give us the parking self-check-in facility. And the web portal will be accessible from any smart device. So your smartphone, your tablet, your PC, any smart device that's internet connected will be able to connect onto this customs roll on, roll off service, which is the current tag. I've no doubt they will come up with an acronym for it over the near future. Um, but currently they're talking about the customs roll on, roll off service tab that will be available on the revenue website. So if we look at an inbound vessel from the UK, as we know, we have um, a number of stages to go through with the pre-boarding, we have the onboard and we have the arrival at the Irish port. And revenue have gone through what each party in the chain as they see is what their role and responsibility will be. First of all, they're talking about um, the declarant. So the declarant 
on the declaration is the person that's, that's making the declaration and that could be the importer, it could be a customs agent, it could be a logistics company or it could be a hauler. It's somebody that has been appropriately uh, appointed by the importer to carry out the declaration on their behalf. So pre-boarding in the UK, revenue's message to the trade is you must pre-lodge your customs declarations. This is not news to us, we've known this. You must have your import declaration uploaded on the system with the MRN number available. But now they're saying from that information, you're going to create your PBN, your pre-booking notification. So you must have, if you're shipping, if you've got agricultural products, you must have given perhaps 24 hours notice to add before you board as well. You have to have your safety and security declaration made. You may be moving on the transit, in which case you're quoting the MRN number for the transit. Or if you're, if you're making an import declaration, then you're gonna quote the MRN for the import declaration or for the import declarations. So if you have multiple declarations, then you must quote all of the MRNs that apply to that one trailer. So if you've got 20 shipments and you've got 20 import declarations, then you must upload or you must import 20 MRN numbers into the portal and you will end up with a single PBN. So there can only be one PBN per truck. And what is the PBN? So the PBN is the virtual envelope into which details MRNs of all the customs declarations for all of the goods being carried on that vehicle for that journey are placed. So you group all of your MRNs, if you have 20 shipments, 20 MRNs plus however many MRNs you have for safety and security declarations all go into the one transaction on this web portal to give you a single PBN for that vehicle or trailer. What purpose does the PBN serve? So it gathers together all of the declarations for a vehicle for a particular journey. It enables the channel to be assigned to the vehicle based on all of these declarations. And the PBN data is reused by revenue to create the presentation notification. So the presentation notification is, is the language that they're using now with, with AIS. And if you're not aware, the, the import declaration system that we currently use, the AEP system, is changing in November to the AIS system, which will be the automated import system. It's currently in test mode. We don't have uh, access as yet to the front end as users. So for any of you involved in declarations, you, you cannot go and test the AIS system as yet, but it will come in in theory, at least, it's going to come in in November, and there is a five-step process to customs clearance after we have the AIS system in place. And one of these steps is the presentation notification. So this language that they're using here is saying that the PBN will satisfy the presentation notification requirements of the AIS system post-November. Who can create a PBN? So anyone in the supply chain can create a PBN. So as I said, it's, it's not locked behind a Ross cert. It's out front and center of the revenue website. So the logistics company, the driver, the declarant, the importer, the customs agent, anybody can create the, the PBN. So it's absolutely vital that you know who is going to do it because you don't want two PBNs being created for a single load. So you want one PBN only. So you must coordinate between the different parties and decide who is going to make the PBN. How is it created? So the create, it's created on the revenue website in this customs Roro service. We can't test it either at the moment, but it will be available. What is needed? You need at least one MRN, depending on the type of movement. So if it's a single full load, you may have one MRN. In most cases, you're going to have multiples because you'll have an import declaration and you'll have a safety and security declaration, but you may just have a transit. So if you're, if you're on transit, you may just have one MRN because the transit may have included the safety and security declaration, in which case you only have one MRN that you have to enter. Um, once the, the MRN has been uploaded, 
the, the PBN system checks with, with, with revenues AEP system or with the safety and security system and will come back with a good to check in status. And you must have a good to check in status before you will get access to the ferry terminal at the port. So you're going to have the PBN. Um, you can create, as you can see here, they have an example. So you could have a carne as an example, you could have a, a transit document, or you may be peeing in your import declaration numbers to, to get the PBN generated for you. It will give you a single unique number. And that unique number now becomes the key to getting on board the vessel in the UK to come to Ireland. So the ferry companies have all signed up to this and, are, and are, have been modifying their systems. So when your vehicle arrives as, let's say, Hollyhead, and you're checking into Stena, so they will be able to look up your vehicle ID against the booking reference that you've given, and they can see that you have a PBN. The driver will either code it to them then, if you haven't, if the, if the hauler hasn't already submitted it to them, the driver can give them the PBN at that stage. Their system will look up the revenue system and they should get back a good to look, a good to check in message. And to get a good to check in message, you will be allowed to enter the terminal. If you do not get a good to check in message, then your vehicle is going to be turned away from board. So check in, pre boarding check in, vehicle rides to the ferry terminal. The ferry operator will confirm, confirm the vehicle and trailer registration. They confirm the PBN reference ID. At this stage, they're going to now match the trailer and the, the PBN. And they will look up, the system will look up the revenue website and see that they have a good to check in. And as I said, if it's yes, then you're good to load. If it's no, you're going to get turned away. I just stuck at that little tab there, the GMR tab, because from an HMRC point of view, of course, they have their own system. So you will have to have had an export declaration made for the load coming from the UK. And in a non-inventory controlled port, you will have to have generated a, a GMR, which is the same concept as the PBN. You have generated a GMR for the export load from the UK so that the ferry operator will actually be looking for your PBN and he'll be looking for your GMR. So step two then, on board the vessel ramp up or sailing off to Dublin, you've successfully got onto the ship. The ferry operator now sends the NIMS manifest, as they call it, to revenue electronically. And at this stage, they've got the correct vehicle registration or truck number paired with the PVN. This now allows them to start analyzing and, and, and looking at routings. So before the ship arrives, at Dublin Port, they will, two hours out, start sending notifications to, to the declarants, not, not to somebody who's keyed in the PBN, not necessarily the haulier, but to the declarant on the declaration. They will start sending messages out about the routings. So you will be able to see, are you green, orange, or red, while you're still two hours out from Dublin Port. If a consignment is rooted orange or red, the declarant needs to provide supporting documentation. They expect, the customs expect, that we will be in attendance, or whoever the declarant is, will be in attendance or available at 2 a.m. if it's 2 a.m. to send that documentation. They do not expect that the market is going to wait until 9 o'clock in the morning to ramble into work and start looking at what your routings are and decide you need to upload more documents to customs. That is not revenues anticipation. They expect that we are going to be operating 24 seven in the same way that they are. So when we get an orange or red routing at 2 a.m., they expect that we're going to start uploading documents then at, at, at 2 a.m. so that they can start analyzing and see can they change that routing from orange or red to green. Thirty minutes out, so two hours out, the declarant, the declarant is advised of the routing. So that gives the declarant time to do some work and maybe get that routing changed. Thirty minutes out, the driver will now 
had available to them the channel lockup that we mentioned at the very start, one of the three functions of the customs row row service is the channel lockup. So from his smart device, the driver can now look up the revenue website and see what routing has he got. He's only going to have two options available to him. He's either going to be green or red. They're not showing him orange. He's either good to go or he's stopped, one or the other. Anybody at that point can look up. So we're back now to where anybody can look up the, the, the web portal to see what channel that vehicle is on. But two hours out is the declarant only is getting the information. 30 minutes out, anybody that's interacting with that web portal can now see where or see what status is it, is it green or red from the driver's point of view. So the driver will have the green symbol on his phone, which will tell him exit the port, or he'll have a red symbol, which is called the customs. So he called the customs will be, you know, typically live animals, scene checks, transits, or other, you know, their, their normal profiling activities, the, the 2% that they have to examine by by sample or where they feel there is a risk involved or they're not happy about something, there could be a call to customs. Stage three then arrives at the port. So a green channel driver leaves the port straight away. Red channel, he has to go to, to the BCP or if it's for a seal check, he goes to T7. If he's on transit, he goes to T7. Um, if he's a call to customs for exam for another reason, he'll go to T11. Ross there, same system, except everybody goes to the Kilrain site. They only have one site. In Dublin Port, we have multiple sites. In Ross there, there's only one site for all the activity. So where a vehicle gets a call to customs channel, and the driver knows that the goods are subject to physical inspection, that the driver can use the parking self-check-in function. So that's the third function now on this web portal that becomes available. So the driver goes to the, the examination area, finds a parking bay, pulls into it with his PBN reference ID or his vehicle reg or his trailer ID because they've all been linked on the system. He will notify by text the parking bay number that he's in and his mobile number. He then sits and waits. And revenue, when they have a relevant, a relevant inspection area available, they will then send the text to the driver and he'll be called then to go to the relevant, to, to the clicker bay and examination will follow. So the three functions for, for the, the, the web portal are, one, you get your pre-booking notification, which is a single number for the complete load of all the MRNs on that. That gets linked to your ferry booking. It gets linked to your trailer number. The second function then is that it allows the channel routing for anybody who has access to the web portal. So the driver, the logistics company, the importer, the declarant and so on can access the web portal and see what routing that vehicle has. And the third function then of, the, of that web portal is it's a registration process for the driver for the queuing system. When he gets to the examination area, he logs in, tells them what base in, gives them his mobile number, and then they will text him when, when, he's, when the space available for him. So that's the import side, really easy, isn't it? On the export side, so with customs declaration submitted to revenue to cover all the goods on the trailer, we'll have an export declaration is submitted prior to the parcel of the goods. Our control is required that may be done at the trader's premises or carried out at the board, depending on what facilitation you have. The MRNs for all the declarations will be supplied to the person completing the PBN. So again, in reverse, when we're exporting, we gather all our MRNs together, we populate it into the web portal, and we get a single PBN for the export load. If we're on transit, the declarant can submit a combined STAD declaration, which is a transit and safety and security declaration combined, or they can submit a transit declaration and separately a safety and security declaration, DXS, or they can use the simplified transit. Um, if they're using the simplified transit, then all the formalities are completed at your premises. You don't have to call the customs to get the tag issued. If you're using a normal transit, then the driver will have to call the customs at the export station with his LRN in order to get the TAD issued. 
the MRNs then for all the declarations have to be populated into the into the web portal so that you get your pre booking your pre boarding notification. Again, that's just looking at the, the, the same thing in reverse. So you get a good to check in and the ferry operator will let you into the terminal. So after, sorry, the ferry, when you get to the ferry terminal to check in, you're going to give the ferry operator your PBN for the export load, but you'll also have to give them the GMR for the import side. So the ferry operator, all the, all the ferry terminal operators in the UK were given the option of being temporary storage facilities or pre-lodging declarations. And I think they have all 100% gone for pre-lodgement of declarations. So none of them are operating temporary storage facilities. So you must have evidence that a declaration has been made by the importer in the UK before you board the vessel. Now there is a, a temporary uh, easement in the UK that you don't have to make a declaration for six months. So in effect, if you have the EORI number of the importer, and if the importer in the UK has been set up to avail of that temporary easement, then you will only have to quote their EORI number, populate the GBMS database with that EORI number in order to get your GMR reference. So you have to remember, everything is split now. You know, the UK administration is separate from the Irish administration. So you're doing everything pretty much twice. So we have the PBN for the export load from Ireland going out. You will have to have the equivalent for the UK, which, is, which they're calling the GMR, Goods Movement Reference Number. Um, so to, to get the GMR, all you need if they're using the temporary import facility, but they're not making a declaration at the point of entry, is the EORI number, the new GB EORI number of the importer in the UK. But you'll have to have both the PDN and the GMR for the ferry operator to allow you access to the terminal public. So the ferry operator will confirm the vehicle trailer registration and will update his system. He will check with revenue that there's a, a good check-in green status effectively for that vehicle. If yes, he's allowed on board, and if no, he's turned away. Driver boards the ferry. The ferry operator sub submits the NIMS manifest of revenue. The correct vehicle registration number is now tied with the PBN, and the export clearance process is, is finished from a, a revenue point of view. So, in summary, I suppose the message from revenue is you must pre lodge all your customs declarations, you must create your pre boarding notification PBN. There is only one per trip. You input all the MRNs for all the declarations that are on that single vehicle in order to create a single PBN. The driver must know the PBN and the driver or somebody must inform the ferry operator what the PBN is. And the ferry operator then can look that up on the system. And if they have a good check-in, then you will be allowed to proceed. Um, the Northern Ireland Protocol, I'm not sure how much time we want to spend on this, given uh, where, we're, where we're at currently, but I, I think on the inbound side from the UK, this probably isn't going to change. Um, although Northern Ireland is part of the UK Customs Territory, in order to avoid the hard border on the island of Ireland, there is an agreement in place that the UCC will apply in NI. So in effect, when you're moving goods from GB to NI, you're effectively importing them into the EU. So you will go through a customs formality in order to get the goods from GB into NI. And that means then that we don't need to worry because we'll have a single set of rules for, for SPS and uh, safety and security. Goods can move on the island freely like they do now. So Northern Ireland is getting a unique status in that it is in free circulation within the EU, but it is still a part of the GB NI UK customs territory. So it can avail of both worlds. Um, unfortunately, not everybody sees that as a good thing, but 
um, goods moving from GB through NI to the Republic. So yeah, there's, there's, I suppose there's a number of options for everybody then look at. Goods moving from GB through NI to the Republic, it could be cleared in Northern Ireland or they could come down to the Republic on the bond. And they explore it a little bit further here. So uh, goods being imported from GB through NI to, to IE to the Republic. So if goods have been cleared in NI, there's a safety and security declaration made. That's to satisfy the EU. So there's a safety and security declaration presented to NI Customs. And NI Customs will have access to the EU databases in order to allow these safety and security declarations. There'll be an import declaration submitted to NI, NI Customs to cover all of the goods. And goods can be customs cleared by NI Customs and all relevant formalities complied with in, in NI. So they will apply the, the UCC rule book, if you like, to an import coming into NI from GB, even if it's destined for IE. Alternately, you can bring goods into Northern Ireland, have your safety and security declaration made again, because that has to be done um, whether you're on transfer or not. Have the goods then with a transit declaration moving through NI, through NI down to an office of destination in IE and you can clear the goods down in IE. We're not 100% clear as to the clearance process in NI. Could an Irish registered forwarder, as an example, access the system in NI? to clear the goods, or could we use the AEP system or the AIS system to clear goods into Northern Ireland? We probably could not. So the duties, when NI collect duties, they would collect them at EU rates, and they would withhold a, a commission, let's say, and they would re repay the difference then to the EU, and they would, the goods would come into free circulation on the island of Ireland, let's call it and then they would be let come down south. But the administration would be done by NI Customs. The alternative routing would be bring it into NI, but transit it down to, down to Dublin or wherever. So I suppose the ports most affected by this are probably you know, Warren Point, where you could have loads coming from Manchester, maybe going to Monaghan or over to Slag, or I suppose even Belfast. You might have traffic coming from Scotland into Belfast, going going towards Donegal or Sligo or, or coming forward or south. So a decision has to be made at the time when you're making arrange that import. Are you going to transfer it down to IE and clear it in IE? Or are you going to try and, and clear it in NI? Either case, you're going to have to make a, a safety and security declaration. And then you will have to have the appropriate process in place to clear the goods. Um, so then on the export side, this is where we have the, the most recent controversy. On, on the export side, at this point, it's only two weeks ago, whatever it was, we're saying we're, it's not clear what formalities will be required by NI for GB trade. But what we know now is that, that GB don't want any formalities at all. So I think we might just skip over that. We can talk about NI separately if you so desire. Um, and I've got a very briefly, before we go for q and I'm going to very briefly just give you some detail from the Department of Agriculture, which I think it's a bit of an eye opener. So Department of Ag made a presentation a couple of weeks back as well um, with the Irish exporters. Um, we have invited them to make a presentation to ourselves at some stage, hopefully in the not too distant future. Um, one of the things that, that will come up, I think that, that you need to be aware of, rules of origin. So if we assume the NI protocol takes effect as, as it may, goods originating in NI will have a UK origin. They will not have an EU origin. So where we have goods importing into NI from the EU and they would have EU status and be in free circulation or they come from a third country and they pay the duty and they move into free circulation within the EU, that's fine. They are EU goods from that point of view. But if NI are manufacturing and are exporting goods out to wherever, Africa or whatever, those goods are UK origin. They are not 
EU origin, and that would be important, obviously, where, where there are um, agreements in place, trade agreements in place between the UK and third countries. Uh, this has been probably superseded by the events over the last day or two. Uh, okay, in theory, the Northern Ireland Protocol takes effect regardless of any negotiations. Like the, the, the protocol replaced the backstop, it became the front stop. And it is supposed to apply whether there is a deal or no deal. And it can be changed by the, the assembly in Northern Ireland. Every four years, the assembly will have the right to vote on whether they want this protocol to remain in place. So there is a democratic uh, facility there for NI to change away from the protocol over time. But um, initially, the, the protocol is supposed to be in place, deal or no deal. Now, we're not quite certain uh, with some of the things that are going on. But anyway, that's that's where that was at. Um, in terms of agriculture and, and uh, the South, the Department of Agriculture did an analysis of 12 months loads from 23rd of February 2019 to 25th of February 2019 looking at the description of goods coming in from, from the UK. So they looked at 447,212 trucks that moved from the UK in that period. 408,000 of them came to Dublin port. And of interest to the Department of Agriculture would have been 168,710 or 41%, which I think works out to about roughly 400 trucks per day. In the Ross Lair port, they had 39,102, and of interest to ag would have been 12,720. They looked at the different categories and they came up with 25 categories of products that would be of interest to them. And when you look at that, you can see how you would quite quickly get to the numbers that you were looking at on the previous slide. They looked then at a month pattern, 23rd of February, uh, sorry, monthly pattern, yeah, sorry, the monthly pattern, yeah, so it's just a summary per month of the loads that would be available to see where the peaks and troughs might be, and, and October, which is probably, you know, that was kind of a pre-Brexit period, so hard to know whether that influenced that or not, and again, February, we had a kind of a pre-Brexit panic there so there could, may have been a lot of food moving in that period and again in, in October so there might be a bit of a distortion there because of, of what was going on with Brexit at, at those particular points in time. Um, so they then looked at a weekly pattern from the 8th of July 2019 to the 14th of July 2019 which is kind of a neutral period it was we been between kind of brexit -y peak actions. So over the seven days of interest to the Department of Agriculture were 3,255 vehicles. And the peak day there, you can see, is kind of that, that Wednesday it was the, the most um, significant day from, a, from an ag point of view. And then they looked at um, the timings of the sailings and they looked at a specific day, the 11th of July 2019, and they, they tried to see where the peaks were. So, the 5 p.m. arrival had a lot of the 250-odd trailers on that that would have been inter of interest to them. And the 5 a.m., they had 200. 5 a.m., that's probably bad news for us because that means that at 3 a.m., we're going to be getting notifications saying that they want to see more documents coming in. And then they gave us some nice pictures of the four facilities. And as we know from Dublin Port, they've spent in excess of 30-odd million um, to, and they've I think there's something like 24% of the land mass available has been dedicated to Brexit. So, you know, they've, they've geared up fairly well for it down there or, or as best as they can. Briefly, the Department of, of Ag gave us some information about how they see the UK post transition import controls. Um, but if you, if you look, we can send you a link to, to, to um, the, the import procedures that the UK have, have issued. You know, for the first six months, they're talking about fairly light controls on normal goods and no need for safety and security declarations for the first six months on ordinary cargoes. Um, 
they will then move to uh, all traders importing live animals from high risk plants and plant pods will be required to have pre notification and health documentation from January 1. So ordinary goods will be moving quite freely for the first six months, but where you have high risk plants, plant products, they will require pre notification and health documentation from January 1, 2021. Um, and then they scale that up gradually over the six months, they go into a full regime like what we will have from day one. So over the first six months, it's kind of going to be a little bit of a process as they let Brexit bed in, whereas in Ireland, it's going to be an event. Everything is going to happen from day one. We'll have to be fully compliant with everything from day one. So that is the scary bit, I guess, from uh, I. Just, I also shared this, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. I don't know if they get that from Roy Keane or not. 67% of rejections from third countries are due to documentary errors, with a further 12% being rejected because of inconsistencies between the documentation and the identity checks. So yeah, a bit of advice they were giving us, how prepared are you? Who is going to comply with the pre-notification requirement of at least 24 hours in advance, including submission of correct health, vital sanitary, IUU certs, and supporting docs? So I require 24 hours notice in advance of the load arriving. Now we have asked the question, if we rock up to the port and by accident we get shipped early, Will they deal with that load early? And we're still waiting for the answer back on that. But you know, it's always possible that you might get on an earlier vessel than what you would have expected. They have asked people to consider, oh sorry. Um, they have asked that we consider um, with, with groupies makes loads, make sure that anything that they might have to look at would be at the back door as an example, so that they can look at it quickly, that they don't, don't have to strip out a whole trailer to try and find two pallets of, of products, or that we try and group classes of products together so that maybe stuff that is of a lighter touch could be on on its on one trailer and cargo that might be of more interest to them could be grouped together on a separate trailer. They're also warning us about the wooden packaging requirements of ISPM 15. So any woods wood coming into the EU post Brexit from a third country such as the UK will have to be ISPM 15 certified or you know which is heat treated or the load will have to have been fumigated. And you know, are they gonna get into the back of every trailer to look for, for every pallet? Possibly not, but they have warned us that if pallets come in and they are not ISPM 15 standards, then there will be a problem. And also that if you have a pallet comes in and it has been repaired and the repair material is not an ISPM 15 standard, then you will also have an issue. So you need to be aware that wooden pallets can become a problem over time. And they warn us about make sure drivers have connectivity uh, with their smartphones when routing through the different ports. Uh, for AIS, there's a video um, on AIS issued by Revenue. We will send you the link to it. It's about 30 minutes long. For any of you involved in import clearances that haven't looked at it, you need to have a look at it because it is going to change the way we make we do imports. We don't have the touch and feel as yet of the AIS system, and of course, the basic data is going to be um, who the importer is, who the exporter is, what vessels are coming on, and so on. But there are some system changes in the way uh, data is communicated, so it will be important to have a look at that. So that kind of concludes. Um, the, the presentations as they were given to us by Revenue and by Ag. There was a lot of overlap with Ag and Revenue on different bits and pieces. So we go for a Q&A now, if that's okay with you, and then um, let's see what answers we can give you. If somebody wants to stick their hands up, maybe Seamus would unmute them if they want to ask a question, or you can send the questions in there on the chat either. There's one, there's one in the chat already. It's um. After lodging PBN info and receiving the PBN number, is there any reason that you would not receive a good to load message on ferry, provided the info matches trailer details? 
No, as far as we're aware at the moment, uh, no is the answer to that. Provided that your PBNs, provided that your MRNs are valid. So the PBN does a validation check on the MRNs. So what could go wrong? Let's be honest, this is a 19 character number that you're keying in. So if you're keying it in manually and you've got 20 of them, you could easily make a mistake. So you would get the PBN rejecting and they have told us that if there is an MRN that's not valid, that it will highlight that that they will highlight the invalid MRN. So then you would have the opportunity to correct that one and send it again. But you will be able to work through the process. Our understanding is that you'll be able to work through it until you get it good to check in. You will know that yourself. It's like getting a green root on the side. You will know that yourself before you let the truck go to the terminal operator, that you have a good check in PBN. So the mistake could be that you just miss type one. The system will not know if you should have 20 and you only put in 19. The system is not going to know that. But if you key in an incorrect one, the system is validating the existence of the MRN. So you could get a rejection to say, well, no, you don't have uh, a valid MRN listed on this PBN. And it won't give you a good check in at that point. Okay. There's a query there about trailers transiting through the UK from Italy to Ireland. Okay, so with, with transit, um, we we hope to kind of map out that route for you. So you're going to deal with the SI Brexit system. You'll end up dealing with the GVMS and you'll end up dealing with the PBN. So you're going to have to populate the three different portals with the transit number. So assuming you issue your transit in, in Italy, then when you're getting to, to Calais, you're going to be, as you're coming, you know, uh, on, on the train or even Calais over, you're going to have to populate the, the Brexit SI system with the, PV, with, with the transit number and the trailer information to get a match and then confirm that with your, with your booking as such. And then you will get a routing through Calais to Dover, um, you'll have to populate into the GVMS and the GVMS then will handle the, the transit uh, procedure at the exit port from the UK and then you'll populate into the PBN and you'll have a call to customs to get the transit discharged at Dublin port. So you have to populate three different web portals with the transit. Okay, uh, next question there. Do you, do you see a technical solution or other to avoid all companies having to have staff working out of hours? Um, I suppose that the, the, the only thing at the moment I can say about that is that at least we don't have to go down on our Honda 50s to the, the port the way we used to, to meet the driver and get the documents and hand them in. So I guess in theory, you will have a very good idea what declarations are going to get a call for additional documentation and you would i guess scan that have it available at home somebody will be on duty let's say at whatever time it is and they will upload when they when they get the call for the documentation they will upload it but they can do it from the security of their home rather than having to go down to the port other than that i'm not sure what can be done um i Currently, there's not a facility to upload all the documents for every shipment on spec that customs might want them, you know, and that would be probably the solution that you would be looking for there, that for every shipment you have, you would upload all the documents for everything, so that customs, if they wanted to see something, they would have it immediately available. Unfortunately, that facility is not currently there, and I don't see that happening in, in the short term. So, I, it is something that, that uh, is, is is I suppose always on our mind when we're dealing with customs, but at the moment I think we, we have to look at the, the possibility that we have to people on duty outside of normal working hours as we see them today. And unfortunately, because revenue, when they, when they sought 400 additional officers, they did it on a 24 hour basis and they got over 3000 applications. So they don't see it as an issue that you know, to be able to recruit somebody for this type of work, they think it's easy going. But of course, we don't always offer the same terms and conditions as you might get in the public sector. So it can be a little bit different for us. 
Um, is there any lit literature about transiting through the UK from another EU country to Ireland that we can share? Well, you, you can have the information there on the NCTS system, how to use the NCTS system. Um, I'm not sure what, what information um, they would like. Maybe if they want to send us in a bit more information about what, what it is, yeah. like clarification on there. Yeah. It might be easier, perhaps, if you um, if you end your screen sharing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question: If you have if you have AEO status, do you still need to complete safety and declarations for exports from Ireland and imports from the UK? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when transporting a groupage load, oh, oh yeah. When transporting a groupage load from the UK to Ireland, and we have transit bonded to our warehouse in Limerick, I presume we don't have to stop in Dublin Port. Um. Well, theoretically, when you enter a new when you enter a new customs territory, the first point of entry, you're supposed to get the transit. Um, you're supposed to, you know, process the transit, not close it necessarily, but process it. So I would think you would have to call to customs to register the fact that that transit has arrived at Dublin Port and is now on its way to Limerick. I don't think it would be you could just drive out of the port. Uh, on your way to Limerick without making some call to customs to confirm that you're here with your transit. Okay. Um, can you advise for advice for goods that ship unaccompanied? Where will the trailers that are called for customs be pulled to and who's responsible for this? Is there an additional cost for this service? Uh, I'm glad you mentioned cost because um, the Department of Agriculture do charge for the work that they do. So your food importers um, who are not used to having to pay for, for the Department of Ag intervention will have to um, start paying for it, I guess. Um, and not only for, for the intervention by the agricultural officer, but also for the, the creation of the documentation, you know, using traces, creating seabeds and so on. So there, there will be a lot of extra costs, I think, for food importers. Um, in terms of unaccompanied trailers, again, we're, we're, we're trying to reach out to the unaccompanied operators to make sure they understand that the expectation is that if they have a, a red routed trailer or a call for customs on an unaccompanied trailer that arrives at 2 a.m., they're expected to present that trailer promptly to customs. They're not expected to shunt it off somewhere. And in fact, they could not bring it to their own yard unless their own yard was a temporary storage facility, which it won't be. So they, they can't move it from the, the, the terminal operator's compound unless it has a green routing, which is they, they can bring it out of the port or to wherever their yard is. But if it's not green routed, then they must bring it to customs and they're expected to do that within a short period of time of the vehicle or of the trailer arriving. So uh, did that answer that question? Um, what was that question again, Shana, sorry? Um, can you advise for goods that ship on a goods that ship on a company? Where will the trailers that are called for customs be pulled to? And who's responsible for this? Is there an additional cost for the service? Yeah, so most of them are going to go to T seven within within the port for for some level of examination. I would think. Um, who's responsible for it? Well, I would think that the the service provider is going to be the one responsible to get the on a company trailer to the to the to customs to get it cleared. And they're going to have to liaise with whoever the customs declarant is to make sure that if it's a, a document check that the documents have been uploaded and that everything is available for that trailer to be examined if that's what the call is for. If it's for a seal check then fair enough they may they may not need much support from the declarant. But I would think it's the service provider's responsibility to make it happen, it's up to them then to decide who pays the bill because there will no doubt be extra costs. I could see that, that guys will need more shunters available in the early hours of the morning because guys are going to get tied up. If you shunt a load to, to T7 and you park it in the bay and you send your message on the web portal to customs saying, I'm here now, ready to be examined, and you wait for an hour, that's an hour downtime. It's an hour when you're not shunting trailers. So there will be costs for sure and they should be recovered from the markets, no matter how unpleasant that might be. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, two questions about sharing the slides, but take it there's no problem sharing the slides. God, no, these are put there public, publicly, public information, yeah. Okay, and then how long do documents have to be kept for audit purposes? Oh, I think the usual five years plus one year kind of thing. Yeah, okay. But like, there's no document with the DBN, it's just a web portal. So, like, it's, it's your normal customs procedures you're talking about there. It's those normal customs rules apply. So like the PBN is not a document, it's just a, a reference number. It's just a method of grouping all of the MRNs together so that like it would be impossible realistically for a ferry operator to check that you've got 20 MRNs and to record each one of those MRNs on, on his system. So the PBN takes care of that. But the PBN also then acts as a trigger. It's very useful in that it also acts as a trigger. So when the, when the vessel arrives or before the vessel arrives, the PBN is the key to your MRNs getting processed. So if you have 20 MRNs on a trailer, you will start getting routings on those 20 MRNs because the PBN has pulled them together and said to customs, here, I'm on this ship, I'm going to arrive. So it is a useful tool in that way. Um, if you're empty, by the way, you also have to go into the system and declare yourself as being an empty trailer and get a PBN for it. So from a hauler's point of view, you will get a PBN even if you're empty. And allegedly customs are aware that trailers going onto the vessel are weighed and they can see the weights. So if an anomaly arises where some guy takes a load on, declares himself as empty, allegedly they will be able to identify that. Uh, next one now, for ocean freight imports, we can wait up to a week for inspection on agriculture products. How can the Department of Agriculture manage existing traffic as well as having an interest in up to 450 trailers from the UK every day? Yeah, big challenge for them, but they've recruited extensively, although they, they won't disclose the number to us, but they have recruited extensively and they have the new facility there in the port, um, which they didn't have access to previously. So they're saying that they're going to be able to cope. But their demand is that, that we adhere to the 24 hour uh, notification in advance. But they're saying they will cope with us. You know, it's only when we get the tests and, and, and you know actually work it that we're going to find out. Again, what we we were hoping to maybe get a few trials done in the port over the next couple of months, where we could, you know, maybe select a vessel and then nominate some get some hauliers to buy into this and get some drivers nominated and say like. Right, you actually have to go for examination and see how well the signage works and how well the routing works and can they follow it and can they get to T7 or T11 and you know kind of just synthesize what, what the system might look like. They're, they're doing the same in France uh, they're, with Calais, they're going to do it in, in Dover. Um, HMRC and French Customs won't cooperate on it but um, everybody's hoping that FIFA and uh, FBE, whatever they call themselves, will be able to organize us on the same day at the same time so that in fact we get a we get a real simulation. So we are hoping that we can try and get some simulations done at the port to see how the traffic management is going to work, but also maybe get some idea about how the violence will work. But but you know, agriculture to be fair to them have done a lot of research and they say that they have scoped it and that they are they are resourced to do this. We're only going to find that out when Okay, uh, there's a concern there in customs understanding the resource challenge on the industry side in terms of meeting all these various demands. Yeah, again, huge problem. We, we've, we've been arguing this for uh, for two years now that we, we realistically don't have all the resources in place. It would have been foolhardy for many of us to have gone, on, uh, gone off and invested and trained staff for the first Brexit date, never mind the second or third Brexit date. Um, we know Brexit is happening this time, so yeah, we need to train, train, train. We need to take, you know, avail of whatever grant aid is available to us. Seamus has information there on, on different schemes that are available to us to help with training. Um, we're going to have to try and upskill as quickly as we can. We have pleaded with Irish Customs and through our through our meetings in Keycat in Brussels, we have pleaded no more new systems, please. You know. It, we have to cope with the existing systems that we know. We have to move from AEP to AIS, which we will have to become familiar with. 
and then we got layered on this PDN, and we got SE Regsys, and we have CVMS. So we're saying, look, guys, you got to stop. No new systems. Let's work with what we have now and try and make sure that we can make that work as best as we can. But we know it's going to be a challenge. Okay. As a query for clarification about PBMs, when creating a PBM for import from UK into Ireland, we're putting in the UK uh, export MRN to create a valid PBN. Not really, no. Do you know why I have all? The, I had all the costs in. Sorry, folks. Um, yeah, so I might, might just meet my microphones. Yeah. Sorry, I have to find oh, another. Yeah. Never. Sorry, Tom. Uh, query there is. When creating a PBN for an import from UK into Ireland, we're putting the UK export MRN to create a valid PBN. Is that correct? And then, sh then should we, should the import clearance process start? No, it's the, the, the UK export MRN goes into the GVMS system, the goods vehicle movement system to generate a GMR, which is a, a goods movement reference number, which satisfies UK customs and satisfies the ferry operator to, to half satisfies the ferry operator because it gives them one half of the picture. It tells them you've completed the export UK side. The PBN, which is the Irish one, is populated with the Irish MRNs, the Irish import declarations and the safety and security declaration for the EU. So you're not putting the UK MRN into the Irish PBN. You're only putting your Irish import declarations and the safety and security declarations for the EU into the Irish PBN. But separately, you have to, put, you have to populate the UK GVMS system with the UK MRNs for the export declaration. So you end up with two of these numbers. Now you'll end up with a PBN, pre-booking notification, or pre-boarding notification, and a GMR, goods movement reference number for the UK and the PBN for Ireland. But they're, you know, they're separate. The systems are not common. They're not, they're not sharing information. They're, they're split. You know, so when you, what you do in chief goes into the GVMS. What you do in AIS goes into the PBN. I'm sorry, your ICS or, or ENS declaration goes into the PBN. Okay. If after receiving a red entry and submitting documents to customs, customs then require original documentation for clearance, Will a color up? Will a color upload suffice, or is a hard copy required? And if hard copy is required, will Customs House be open twenty four seven? If a hard copy is required, then in theory, uh, yes, it will have to be presented at the port. And in theory, yes, the Customs House will be open twenty four seven to accept us. Um, COVID, COVID may have been our friend in in part of this. In that, you know. We're, Customs did take a slightly more lenient view about some documentation, but but not. I think when it comes to agricultural documents, you know, health certs will have to be in original form and will have to be lodged. There won't be any leniency on that side. Um, but maybe customs might, with a bit of luck, um, they might accept PDFs. We'd have to see with them. You know, it's 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 a discussion that we'll be having again in in two weeks' time. Um, but in theory. If they go back to hard copy, then hard copy will be presented at the port, and the port is, in theory, going to be open for you to do that. Super. Tom Owen here in uh, Aramex. How are you? Hi, Owen. Just a quick one, and apologies um, if you've covered this already, but when you create a, a PBN for imports coming into Ireland and you're uh, you know, filling that with the individual MRN references, which will then be checked um, two hours or whatever prior to the, the vessel arriving. If you're moving that load, and this is regroupage, okay, um, if you're moving that load under a transit to an inland TSF, but when the PBN is being checked and an MRN turns up red on that, the driver then gets a notification to go to customs, but is moving with the goods under transit to an inland example, Aramex bond. 
Yeah, so if you're moving under transit, then you won't have had to upload the MRNs, your import declarations. Right. So you, you, you will be using the transit to move it under the bond to the TSF, and then you'll be uploading your MRNs. Okay. You deal with it then. But just be aware, you know, you can't bring anything that would be controlled. Oh, I know, yeah, I'm speaking in terms of general, yeah, 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 yeah. non-controlled goods, Tom, yeah. So in, in another couple of questions that we did ask them was, you know, what happens if by accident, if we had 20 shipments on the trailer, but we only lodged 19 MRNs in error. Yeah. Which could happen. Yeah. So there is, there is a facility um, under AIS, I think they call it an I-2, whereby you would overland the goods at your warehouse when you discover it, and you would, you would create a, I think, I think they call it I-2, which will satisfy their, um, their PN stage within the within this new pentalogy of import clearance as they call it and you will then process your customs clearance you know obviously if it happens very often then you, you're going to have a, a headache but you know they are trying to understand that you know it could happen that you might put a, an mrn you may fail to put an mrn by accident you might you might fail to declare uh, a shipment on on a trailer it should be an occasional event not a regular event and hopefully it wouldn't be for anything that would be normally a controlled good either, because then you'd have a, a bigger headache. Yeah. Um, equally, if you overland something, you know, you, you, you have to come back to us now, I have to say, with, with, with both of these issues. But in theory, if you overland something and you actually got a green routing, then they, they are looking at seeing how they could manage that you wouldn't have to go through the whole process again, recall the entry and resubmit the entry and so on. So they're, they're trying to look and see how that might work as well so yeah because like when you're looking looking at volumes of of uh, mrns the way you would be as an example it could be very easy just to make an error with being in the wrong one you know it's, it's actually on a different trailer or something like that so and we are trying to work through those issues with them to try and see what the what the remedies are in those rare occasions where a mistake might happen okay okay thanks tom Uh, no other questions on the chat box there. If anybody has a question, they'd like to shout out, go ahead and, and uh, unmute yourself and just um, ask away, I suppose. Oh, here we are. Uh... Okay, uh, long one here. We've been trying to engage with the market over the last few weeks with little appetite from customers and potential customers. Companies who are not used to dealing with customs formalities at present and, are, and who are maybe only trading with the UK are in the main unaware of the complexities of what is ahead of them. How do we as an industry get the message out to the market that companies must engage now so there is not mayhem on January? In January? Yeah, it, it, again, unfortunately, like COVID has taken all the bandwidth for the last six months, and we've been appealing to customers to try and push Brexit back up the agenda. Like, we really, we need, we need a COVID level communication nearly at this stage about Brexit, because, as you say, the market is very unprepared. Um, all you can do is just keep pushing your own side. And we, customs have said that they will have an outreach program, but to be honest, it hasn't been terribly effective so far um, in that they tend to, to come to, you know, ferry operators, they come to ourselves, they go to FTAI and so on, um, and IBEC, and, but it, it just doesn't seem to be getting the message through. I, I think politically, because there was so much about, oh, there'll be a deal, and people still don't get it, even if we have a free trade agreement, there will still be customs declarations. It just means there won't be duty on the most of what comes in. But trade agreement or no trade agreement, there will be customs declarations. That is a given. So we just need to get that message out there to people. And then we need to push people as well to try and start looking at the documentation that they're producing. Because if you don't get quality documentation, then you cannot make the customs declaration. So they need to start looking at their supply chain and the suppliers and make sure they can get a proper commercial invoice that is all the information on that you need to make a customs declaration. But it is a slog, there is no doubt about it. It is a slog. Like we're, we're pushing as much as we can. And 
And but I think everybody within the association has to keep the message going out to their customers. You know, you need to get prepared now for Brexit. If you haven't got an EORI number at this stage, you really must go and get it. Like, don't delay any longer. You must get your EORI number. And start asking, asking them for sample documentation. Make sure they can produce a document on, on either on, at the time of the shipment or before you make the collection. You know, because otherwise you're, you're not going to be able to make the declaration on their behalf. And, you know, the dog is not going to go anywhere. Unfortunately, it might reflect on you then rather than on them, which is the other issue. So um, it's, we just have to keep pushing the message. We're, we're pleading with with, um, with revenue to push the message out there again, you know, to get Brexit back up the agenda. I suppose Boris has done us a little bit of a favour um, with his shenanigans there last day or two. At least it has crawled back up as a news item. And we are in touch with Tony Conley as well to try and uh, keep him on side and, and get our message out through him as well as much as we can. Um, you know, we do podcasts, we do interviews whenever we can, but I think everybody has to keep pushing their client base. We're dealing mainly with the customers that are going to be affected, so we need to keep pushing them to get to get themselves prepared. Cool. A few short questions in here. So on trailers to Italy using the Land Bridge, where can the tea form be discharged on arrival in Calais? Well, Calais will not be a, an office of destination. So Calais and, and Dunkirk will no longer be available on the NCTS systems as offices of destination because Calais just will have too much volume to deal with to be a transit destination. So you, you would, ideally, I guess you would issue your transit out maybe to, if you have an agent in Milan who, who has the facility to take and discharge it, issue it to Milan or else you'll have to issue it to a, to a, a custom station maybe somewhere outside of, of uh, Calais maybe even towards Paris look at look at the routing look at what the logical time because most of those there are there I think 60 65 or 67 or something custom stations in France that could discharge transits and um, but most of them close at five o'clock uh, they don't open on Sundays I, don't think they work Saturdays that much either. So you need to look at, at where you might get it discharged. Um, but it won't be Calais. So ideally, I would suggest talk to your agent in, in Milan and see can they have they the facility to receive it and discharge it. You know, they may be an ACE and have a TSF facility there and discharge the transfer for you. Cool. Okay. Um, at present, it is only to be NI badge holders who will be able to do IE entry decorations from NI to IE, or will GB-based decorations be able to be done also? Sorry, NI. So uh, at present, it is only NI badge holders who will be able to do who will be able to do IE entry decorations from NI to IE, or will GB-based decorations be able to do this also? Would GB so NI badge holders um, can do decorations. Yeah. GB from GB. Um, so yeah, I guess the question is, could somebody in Manchester clear yeah. a load yeah. from the Republic of Ireland at, at Belfast? That's right, yeah. Okay, I, I, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to find out. Okay. Um, how early can you present the documentation to the AES system prior to shipping? Oh, I, th I think it's still 30 days. Like it's not, um, the, the issue is not, early presentation. I, I think you have, you have 30 days um, you could present in advance of the shipment. That's that's not a problem. Cool. Have customs given any indication that the payment of VAT can be deferred to the importer's VAT returns be offered again? Yeah, so so we have the omnibus bill that didn't get passed last time um, when Brexit did not happen is still there. And um, we're not certain that it will be the the bill that will be passed um, before Brexit actually happens, but we expect that it will be. We most likely are going to move to to move away from that point of entry. But again, it's a, again, it's a question that we're, that we're asking just to get final clarity on. But it, we we would anticipate that that plan will, will will remain in place. That we will move away from that point of entry for third countries. So that won't just be for 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 GB goods. It will be for China for US and so on because you cannot discriminate under the, the trade rules you cannot discriminate 
against one country or against one third country against another. So once they remove that point of entry, it's for all markets. And we, we do believe that that will happen. The only thing I guess that might stop it would be the political will and you know a shortage of cash, um, possibly because of COVID and the impact that it's had. You know, we might find that that they might like to roll back on that decision, but we would anticipate it will go ahead. We argued very strongly that that uh, they would remove that point of entry because it would be a huge burden for us to have to try and collect fat as well as duty, because not every shipper will have duty on it, but every shipper will have fat. So pretty much, so it would be a huge burden on the industry to have to try and collect the fat. So we'd be arguing very strongly that they need to move away from that point of entry. Um, might there be costs associated with the trailer inspection by revenue? And if so, when will, will we get an idea of what that might be? Yeah, there could be a cost. Um, they have advised us, any of you that have the experience currently of getting loads stripped down in the port, it's, it's done by a third party service provider and the, the figures are very high. Um, we brought it up with customs and they have said that it will be their own labor as such in future and that the cost will be as as uh, close to cost, the cost for the trade will be as close to the cost as possible. Um, but it, again, it's it's an agenda item that we have with them to visit again the next time we meet them. So they will be moving away from that third party service provider when, when they're fully in situ post Brexit and they will be doing the examinations themselves. So they say the cost will come down, but we just don't know how much as yet. Um, I don't know will they actually have a, a tariff as such in place. Um, we're not kind of encouraging them, we're encouraging them to offer it as a facilitation rather than as a chargeable item. But I'm not sure how far we get with that argument. Okay. That's our chat box of questions clear for the moment. Um. Okay, I, I think for, for, for um, for our homework, well, we're going to keep working on So we, it would be great to get more questions in, anything that we haven't answered today, anything that you think about, no matter what you, you know, no matter how obscure you might think it is, send it in to Seamus so that we can, we can go through as many questions and, and tease this out as much as we can the next time we sit down with customs, which I think is in, in two weeks. And the other piece of homework we're trying to work on is a route mapping. So we didn't talk a lot about land bridge in any great detail, but but our idea is that we will we will look at what you do to get from Dublin to Hollyhead, as an example. What you do to get from Dover to Calais, um, and vice versa. So we would try and work out that every route we would we would have a plan for us. There there is um, the AIS. So your homework, from my point of view, would be look at the look at the AIS. Uh, system with the presentation that customs have made. Seamus will have the link available for you, I guess. Yeah, you send it yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, I can send it out. Yeah. yeah. So look at look at AIS and make sure you you're starting to develop your understanding of what AIS is. You cannot touch and feel it at the moment, but you will be able to hopefully before November. And uh, again, the PDN you can't touch and feel at the minute, but we do hope there will be some testing done in the near future. The guys Biffa in the UK have invited us to test the GVMS system. So if you're interested in testing GVMS, then again, email Seamus. We have to send a list to BIFA and they will organize a test then. And they would like us, you know, they'd like a decent volume test made of the GVMS system. So if you don't mind, send, a, send a, your name into Seamus and he will share it with the guys in BIFA and they will set you up to do a test on the GVMS system. And it should be quite similar, I would guess, then to the, to the PDN system whenever it comes into play. Um, so you have a bit of homework. We have some homework. 24-7 um, is also the other thing that we have to keep mulling over and um, how we're gonna respond. And then keeping the market informed about how they need to upskill, what extra effort they need to put in to get documentation to you in time so you can make the declarations on their behalf. And then Seamus has a few comments to make, I think, about training and training grants. Uh, yeah, I can do that quickly now. Um, let's see. Uh, 
I just got this done. Did stuff in there. Um, okay, so just in terms of some resources that are available for members to uh, help ease the burden of what's ahead. Um, in the you might remember Trade Ireland had a Brexit planning voucher of 2,250 euros that could be put against uh, training or advice. But the good news is anybody that availed that previously, that's between 2017 and 2019, are eligible to apply for a further 2,250 euros worth of uh, training vouchers. So if you used it before and you become a bit rusty and you want to kind of um, get a voucher towards training again, you can reapply through Intertrade for that voucher. Um, there's a bit of red tape that goes with it. So if it's, if it's something you kind of want in two weeks, probably better get it, probably better for applying for it now so it's ready in time. Now, just announced today, um, as part of the, gov the government's readiness, Brexit readiness action plan, Enterprise Ireland will have a ready for customs grant available in the coming weeks which essentially is going to be nine, a grant of 9,000 euros per employee that is hired or redeployed within a business to a dedicated customs role. So if you're looking to uh, create or bolster a customs department with new staff, this is a grant that can go towards getting you ready for that. Um, it's something that our association has kind of been seeking with government and with Enterprise Iron directly, and we're very pleased to see that, that we've been the voice was heard and there's, there's uh, resources out there. Now in terms of customs training, just to um, remind folks about our own training, primarily we, we as a FA had our own six week customs training course that used to take place um, in classrooms. We've now re-edited it that takes place across six weeks again, but with two 90 minute Zoom sessions per week. So we know customs declarations are a, a difficult task to learn and uh, can be very frustrating. So we figured that um, the best thing to do is have continuous engagement with train trainees throughout a program. So we do six weeks with two 90-minute sessions per week where we'll be going through academic material at the start, but then engaging with um, trainees and doing declarations side by side, where we can kind of we have a system whereby we can do it online and look over your shoulder while you're doing declarations. And if you have any difficulties, we can go back and forth similar to what we're doing, doing now. And of course, we've got an updated training or reference manual that goes to go with it as well. Um, it takes a bit of planning. We've got it, we had a group started yesterday, so they had one session yesterday, and we've got another 90 minutes tomorrow as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a, how we're working with that one. Again, it's a bit of, bit of work in kind of getting these sessions planned and getting them working. Um, but if it's something you'd be interested in doing, um, maybe give us a shout sooner rather than later so we can kind of plan these groups together. Um, do them last minute never really works but if you're, if you're thinking you might have let's say four people to do a training course in two weeks time let us know we can start building to working towards that what I have in that show. Um, there's no other questions in there so I think we're good to finish up for the moment um, like Tom said if you have any, any comments you want to send in we'll be grateful to receive them and uh, take them forward to various agencies I think that's that time. Are we good to? There was, there was a couple of questions that we got earlier. Am I going to go there? Um, do we pull SPS, up, do, do SPS requirements be included on the PBN? The answer to that would be no. So you're, you're not putting in vet certs or anything like that on the PBN. You're only putting in the MRNs for the for the safety and security declaration and the import declaration your SPS stuff will be dealt with separately. Um, at what time pre-boarding is the PBN required to be submitted? So really it's before you get to the terminal. So there isn't a time limit on that in that you have to do it an hour in advance. You just have to have it done before you get to the ferry operator so that you have your, your good to ship routing. Otherwise you're going to get turned away from the, from, from the port. Um, whatever. With all parts of visibility on status, uh, yes and no. Um, on the PBN, you will have visibility whether whether the truck is rooted green or red, but you won't know if that red is actually orange or red. You won't know why, why it's red necessarily. And info and registration process. So there is no registration. They've, they've kept it that it's outside any registration or cert, cert, certificate type process. You can just log on to this or you can just access this to, through the, the revenue website. So there's no restriction getting access to it. They want it to be available as much as possible to as many uh, stakeholders as is possible so that the system can be used. 
quite easily by, by anybody or everybody. So that was it. That's it, Seamus. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think we're good. Okay, so um, we'll let you all go home now, and uh, I'm sure you know where we are, and we'll be in touch with more updates. Yeah, and please, any questions you have, send them in. It'd be great to get them. Cool. Thanks, guys. Bye now. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Thank Fair you. Play. Cheers, Seamus. Take care. Cool. Thanks. Thanks very much. Oh, there was time there.